Hello and welcome back to an in-depth discussion of the history of the Community of Christ or the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as it was once called. It's also a history of the LDS Church, all with the wonderful and inspiring John Hamer. So welcome back, John. Hi, John. Thanks. So we, we left off. We, we covered sort of the founding of the uh, you know original church that Joseph founded, which we learned wasn't actually called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but was called the uh, Church of Christ. We went from sort of that founding of the church through the succession, the original succession crisis, I'll call it, which was the showdown between Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young. Um, so where do we take off? Uh, where do we take up from there? So next, if we go to this next um, diagram, I'm having here like kind of like a big circle, which is kind of representing the whole church. And, and I'll just right I'll, I'll remind our listeners that this is also on YouTube. So if you're not watching this on YouTube, we have some wonderful visuals you can check out on YouTube, but you can listen in audio form as well. So go ahead and continue, John. Sorry and, about that. And whether or not they can see it, I could just say we envision a big circle um, that is uh, that might represent the church as a whole, because we tend to ignore the the, the broader church whenever we tell um, church history, we really are focusing in really on the the elite at headquarters. We tend to write that as if that's the entire history of the church when obviously the um, bulk experience is the experience of all of the members that comprise the church. Right. And so um, obviously a lot of the people in the church had gathered to Nauvoo, the headquarters, but there were branches spread all around the Midwest and the East especially. Uh, there were people in Britain and other places at the time of um, Joseph Smith's martyrdom, and of course, none of them were involved at all in the in that showdown with uh, between Brigham Young and Sidney Rigdon, since there was you know no capa capacity to have communication uh, in the in that kind of that kind of time period. So, just to restate, uh, Brig Brigham Young may have convinced most of the Nauvoo people to follow him, who had not already left or died. Yeah. But an, an outstanding question was, what would happen with all the local you know, congregations or groupings of of Mormons throughout the world, right? That was an outstanding right. question. Exactly. And so he is, so Brigham Young quickly is in charge um, as acting president of the church of the whole Nauvoo headquarters apparatus. But um, the people that are off in the branches, I mean, that is, um, that doesn't necessarily have a lot of immediate effect on them. So for them, um, their connection to the church is that uh, missionaries come through, and then they also are receiving the church's newspaper. So, um, bringing on the twelve are already the twelve are already um, uh, in charge of the newspaper, but uh, through John Taylor as the editor of the Times and Seasons at this point, and so that is like the way you know those church materials. The the in this era that where we have no internet, this era where we have no telephone, telegram, or any other thing, the way you're connected to the church as a denomination is through the printed press and so these these newspapers are kind of incredibly important um but what ends up happening is uh uh so the although brigham young doesn't initially want to leave illinois um and i think that i th i personally think I mean, this is counterfactual history we don't we can't say what might have happened or what this might have happened um i think that the decision to go with brigham young as opposed to Sidney rigdon um ultimately guarantees that the um, people are going to have to leave Nauvoo because Brigham Young is representing this faction um, that is involved in these secret practices like polygamy that the neighbors in Illinois are not just going to, are, are ultimately aren't going to be able to um, accept. Whereas if a anti-polygamist had assumed control of the church, it is potentially possible that um, the church could have done its reconciliation that it ultimately does with the United States in the 1890s. It could have potentially done that in in the 1840s in Illinois. But in, anyway, regardless, because they didn't, um, people had to leave Nauvoo. Uh, Nauvoo, this boom town, becomes Nauvoo, this ghost town. Uh, Brigham Young um, establishes his new headquarters out in Salt Lake. In the meantime, though, other claimants emerge, like Sidney Rigdon, who moves his headquarters, the church, to Pittsburgh, um, and Lyman White, who moves down to Texas. Uh, uh, closer at hand, um, people like William Smith, but also most successfully and kind of most surprisingly, James Strang, who um, creates a headquarters apparatus uh, that has a complete 
the whole structure from first presidency to apostles to presiding high council, patriarch, everything, uh, and also newspaper. Uh, and so suddenly there are multiple- new scripture too, right? And new scripture. Yeah. So ultimately there are multiple headquarters apparatuses. And so, for example, you're at a certain moment, if you were in the branch, or let's say you're in, you're still living in Kirtland. Um, at some point or other, um, Brigham Young's uh, followers, his missionaries will come through with copies of the Times and Seasons. They'll hold meetings. Everyone's like, yeah, we agree. You know, we're like Brigham Young is the is the successor. He's the president of the church now. But then, then one of Strang's missionaries, or actually in the Kirtland case, Strang actually came to Kirtland himself, held um, meetings in the temple, got everyone excited. Everyone um, read his newspaper. They all agreed that he was the successor. And then he reorganized as a Kirtland stake and has pretend, you know, he has possession of that. And so um, in the branches, uh, it it wasn't necessarily clear who was, you know, it wasn't that there's two churches that exist or multiple churches that necessarily exist. There is this um, overall uh, body of Mormons or Latter-day Saints, and they look to different um, uh, headquarters, and sometimes they will go from one to the next without actually, you know, having to, uh, renou- without changing their affiliation or becoming rebaptized or any such thing. And that's from 1844 to about 1853. That, yeah, that's kind of what I have it on this kind of chart of some of these organizations that exist in that time period. Okay. And so, I mean, I, I, the, the comparison I make is, so there's the schism of the, of the, of the Christian church, of the Catholic church um, in the West, uh, where at some point or other there's a pope in Rome and there's a pope in Avignon. But even though different people, different countries have allegiances to one pope or the other, it's not that there's an Avignonese Catholic Church and a Roman Catholic Church. They're all Catholics, they're all Christians, but they just have competing headquarters. Got and it. so it's kind of unplastic. It's kind of, we can't even think of it this way now because all the churches are completely different from each other. In the LDS Church, um, all the buildings are owned by the, the Central Church Corporation, right? And so that it is, but there were no buildings <laughs> at this time period. Nobody had any buildings except for headquarters. There, so, so this is all much more fluid. Got it. Okay. Okay. So, okay, the next slide, this is a kind of a more conceptual thing. So in our first uh, section here, I mentioned this idea that there is an evolving church. In other, or in other words, things that were the way the Mormonism was in 1830 New York are very different from 1839 Nauvoo. And then in, in the 1840s in Nauvoo, this inner group of people that have been introduced to some secret practices like plural marriage, that is completely that there's nothing of the kind happening in New York, obviously. So I'm I'm doing this with color. Or I'm kind of taking this blue, um, you know, kind of through to Missouri green to Nauvoo yellow, and then this, you know, orange, the secret color that's happening of things that that Joseph Smith is denying in public but practicing in in private. Uh, red hot Council of Fifty stuff. <laughs> red hot Council of Fifty, exactly. Which that doesn't <laughs> even get kept by anybody, right? right so, right. <laughs> so some of that everybody dials back. So it, because Brigham Young says when he, even he gets going, he's like, well, I'm not sure about the last six months of this stuff, and so that all falls by the wayside, <laughs> right? <laughs> so he pulls back to like. 1843. Um, <laughs> then the people in the, so when you're doing this though, so as you're trying to envision, okay, well, what is the true Mormonism? What's my takeaway from this Mormon experience during Joseph Smith's ministry? And now that I'm finding myself in my own faction or in charge of my own church, how do I do, what do I, where am I going with? So, so I'm saying that there's kind of three different ways that one can kind of envision what's my takeaway from this experience? What are we doing now? Where, where are we going now? And the first one I'm calling here is purification, which is people who want to look back and they want to say, uh, the church was right way back when we were doing this and we went off the rails. And that's what happened here, why Joseph got killed um, and why this all, you know, the church got destroyed in Nauvoo and everything else. And you, you, you chose not to use the term fundamentalism, which I think is interesting. It's not fundamentalism. So I, any any one of these, can, any way that you can go here, you can be a fundamentalist anyway. Okay, so, so tell, tell any me. one of these things. So, so in other words, if you, so the the spectrum between what I'd call a fundamentalist and um, uh, and something like a, a progressive religious believer um, is more. It's that's more of a spectrum between whether you're viewing all these kinds of things as being highly literalistic, uh, as opposed to where you're viewing a lot of these things as being symbolic. Um, but that is, but that isn't, um, 
that isn't really the breakdown of the problem or uh, between between these competing factions in 1844 everybody's pretty well fundamentalists in 1844 there's an, they all have a kind of a very literalistic view of things at that point there okay, aren't very okay. many people that are very progressive sometimes i associate fundamentalism with going back to the way it was earlier yeah they, they that's what fundamentalists believe they're doing that is not correct <laughs> so fundamentalists are not going back to the way things were fundamentalists are creating something new in reaction to the way things are now and the other so, thing is there's no such thing as the way things were there's the way things were at a specific time at a specific place that's, right yeah, yeah, yeah so fundamentalism i mean when people say the taliban are medieval that is absolutely wrong. The Taliban are a brand new modern thing. They are a reaction to um, life in this modern world that we have, and they are and they are operating in a way that is totally inconceivable for people in the Middle Ages who had a medieval worldview who are not um, react reactionary to modernism. Yeah, yeah because because uh, medieval Islam was was pretty enlightened, right? Medieval Islam could be could I mean depending on who where you were right 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 and who, who you're but there about. there, there yeah, were right. many cases where <laughs> where um, medieval Islam um, was you know very much more enlightened than a lot of contemporary Christianity at different places right so, got yes, it yes absolutely wonderful okay so three ways to envision the true Mormonism you've got purification preservation right. of the and 1844 no. church which was right. however the church was when Joseph died in Nauvoo and then innovation. Exactly. Okay. So either we, so, uh, and we'll, I'm going to have individual slides for each one. So why don't we move on and we'll talk okay. about it. All right, let's do it. Okay. So purification. So purification, when people are doing that, they've decided, okay, Joseph Smith became a fallen prophet is, is how they answer this question. So if we only could go back to when, uh, you know, so when he when he instituted polygamy, that that's when he became a fallen prophet. When he started that bank in Kirtland, that was wrong. That he when he did that, when he led Zion's camp, this attempt to uh, have a illegal militia uh, militarily restore people to Jackson County, which failed. That when, when he changed the name of the church from Church of Christ to Church of the Latter Day Saints, when he edited his revelations. So when he took the Book of Commandments, all of these revelations were written one way. Suddenly, when we make the DNC, they're heavily edited and changed. Sometimes to the opposite original meaning, right? Sometimes to the opposite original meaning. Sometimes huge new sections are added, all kinds of things. When um, we talked about this before, when he restored the high priesthood. So when we went beyond, you know, deacons, elders, all those kind of things, and we suddenly have in this office of high priest, which is not scriptural. Uh, when he organized the church itself, <laughs> ultimately, you know, ultimately David Whitmer looks back on that and he says, you know, that was a mistake. <laughs> you know, when we organized the church, we had a great church going here when we just had restored the priesthood and we were, you know, when and we were elders and priests and teachers. We hadn't done any organizing of the church. And that was was a mistake to do. Um, and so then, so when people are looking at it that way, they say, if only we could go back to the way the church was at the beginning of Nauvoo, uh, if only we could go back to the way it was in Missouri and Kirtland and New York, then we would bit back to the true church. And so different people, and, and, and one of the ways you can almost always pick out one of these people who kind of, everybody can look at these things. It's not just like there's just purification or just innovation. It's always a mix, right? So this is a simplification of the models. But one of the things when you're looking at people for whom, you know, purifying the church and going back to before Joseph was a fallen prophet and believing that Joseph Smith was a fallen prophet, one of the identifiers is almost always that the guys are going to be called Church of Christ because that's the original name of the church and they go back to it pretty quickly. They like, they want to go back to that point. And so I mentioned David Whitmer, one of the three witnesses um, who's there in the founding of the church before the church is organized and also before the Book of Mormon is even published. Ultimately, he has a Church of Christ, which we tend to call the Whitmerite Church, which um, I mentioned already um, in the previous section I had mentioned, um, with, involved even receiving revelations uh, through seer stones. So the different members of the church were using seer stones to receive revelations. In other words, just like the earliest period of the of the church. Um, likewise, uh, um, 
in the when the church in Kirtland collapses uh, and Joseph and Sidney flee and they go to uh, to Missouri, the people who stay reorganize their church. They take the name back. They call it Church of Christ, and and then they though they proceed to start peeling back the onion. The problem with it is when you're doing this is well. And once you take one layer of the onion off, where do you go next? And so if you decide, well, the bank was obviously wrong, <laughs> the name change was obviously wrong, but then they get to the point where, well, Warren Parrish gets to the point where he decides the Book of Mormon isn't right. The Book of Mormon is a fraud. And so when he did that, well, then Martin Harris, who's a member of his church, Martin Harris, who has, continues to have this intense testimony of the Book of Mormon, says, well, I don't agree with that, right? And so the church can quickly unravel when you go this purification route if you aren't able to fix into, into a particular place. And that happens with Warren Parrish's church and also Sidney Rigdon's church. So Sidney Rigdon is constantly kind of dialing the thing back, and he dials it back to nothing at the end. And schisms begot more schisms. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, next, preservation. Okay, so what we have here is this idea, okay, what Joseph Smith really did here was restore the fullness of the gospel. You know, he sealed his testimony in blood. Boom, we're done it. This is what we got, and we're just going to sit here and wait until the second coming because now we have it all. And so I would say that this um, it was followed by um, churches like Brigham Young's church, um, Lyman White's church, Alphaeus Cutler's church, although in, a, they've, in all cases they dial it back a little bit. So I mentioned like Brigham Young isn't comfortable with a lot of the developments in the Council of 50 because he's been out on missions that whole time and maybe isn't as is aware of all of that. And so um, that kind of falls by the wayside. But uh, g in general, it's like the late Nauvoo era stuff. And what Brigham Young really does is he takes... Um, those secret inner circle practices and the, the main change that Brigham Young does is those are for everybody. So those are now become um, the ch practices that everybody in the LDS church will have as far as Brigham Young is concerned. Um, Lyman White has a similar thing going on in his, his church down in Texas. Alphaeus Cutler, I, I have this color here a little bit differently because although Alphaeus Cutler initially is doing most of the same things, um, eventually he decides that the polygamy is wrong and so the, the and and the believers today um, in, in the Cutlerite Church, um, I, they, they get upset if I were to say this. They, they, they don't believe that Cutlerites ever practiced polygamy because what ended up happening is that the Cutlerites um, renounced it and then they suppressed all memory of it. And so they got rid of all practice of plural marriage and they also wrote it out of their own history. And so um, the Cutlerites kind of preserve a little bit of the um, 18... 43 or 1844, but, you know, without polygamy. And so people like them and are interested in them because they also preserve um, a, they're the only Midwestern um, non-Brighamite Mormon um, church that preserves kind of the Nauvoo era endowment. And so they, they still have the, that portion of it, but they um, don't have polygamy. And I'll just say one quick thing about the Brigham Young's uh, branch. In, in many ways, they're preservationists except in areas where sort of the surrounding culture sort of forced them to to repeal or rescind or roll back certain practices, right? Yeah, so this is the initial, I would say that impulse, what this is going on here impulse. is the initial impulse. Okay. So yes, ultimately, um, ultimately, uh, the LDS church has had to make additional accommodations right. over the yep. years, right? Yep. So, um, and so yes, and the polygamy, I mean, I say, obviously, the LDS church is not polygamous today. Right. So in other words, there has been an additional, there has been additional changes. This is just, this is the initial impulse. And also Brigham Young added some of his own things over time, like Adam God and, and blood atonement and those types of things as well. Which also then get, get so in other words, like I <laughs> which also get rolled back. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So again, I would, I would, I would like to, yeah. I shouldn't, when I'm making a model like this, this is sim highly simplified. So everybody is doing everything. Brigham right. Young is rolling things back a little bit. Yep. He's preserving things a lot. He's innovating a little. And so there is there. All of these things exist for everybody. Um, but I'm just trying to like group these in a way so that we can understand them more easily. But no, no one should no one should think for a second that I'm saying that this is that was a static thing that he preserved perfectly no. and there is no yeah. But there, there's a there's a decent argument to be made that that preservationist impulse continues and that's. Yeah. Most, most in the LDS church, and that's most evident to me by the fact how many sections of the Doctrine and Covenants have we added that didn't come from Joseph Smith? Right. Is, exactly. it, is it none? I mean, no, it's what do you have? Like three. 
Well, yeah, I don't. I don't even count the official decorations. I just mean sections. You know, and there's is one, it three? Is there's is one Brigham Young section? There's one uh, Joseph Smith the Third section dream or something, right? And then there's. I don't know. There may be another one. I don't know. And then there's the two official declarations. I, I, I so it's like two or three, and then we don't have a Joseph Smith the Third dream, do we? No. no, no, no. Joseph F. Smith. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. No, no, if I said Joseph the Third, I'm sorry. Joseph F. Smith, his cousin, right, who was president of yeah. the. Uh, so, uh, and so, and so, in fact, the, the doctrine and covenants is sort of a little different because in the late 19th century or the mid 19th century, um, uh, Orson Pratt went through Joseph Smith materials and added like another 30 or something sections of Joseph Smith material to the Utah DNC. So those are things that didn't exist in the Nauvoo DNC. Right. They don't exist in the Community of Christ DNC. And so, the, so that's why the Community of Christ DNC, you think, oh, well, they can't have added too many more if they're only up to DNC 164. Well, we, we don't have about 30 or so of right. the LDS right. ones that are Joseph Smith related. So, yeah. And, 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 just, this is, and this is a critique that the LDS church keeps getting if we have 15 prophets, seers, and revelators, where's the prophecy? Where's the seeing? Where's the revelating? Right. And it's it's a fair critique to say, are we really living up to Joseph's vision of, of, of those offices? Or are we sort of maintaining ourselves in a in a semi-preservationist state? And, and, and ultimately, like, for example, if you, you can see the development of the thinking about the office of the prophet in the LDS Church, if you read, for example, um, Mike Quinn's books. And so initially, the um, in Brigham Young's time, and then more recently up until before David O. McKay's time, um, there was much more of a sense that the apostles, since the apostles are all prophets, seers, and revelators, and they're all, and the, one of them is the president of the church, that there is um, there is a difference between. Joseph Smith and the later successors to the presidency of the church, and and you can still see it in sort of and so they didn't initially call the leader of the church necessarily the prophet. He'd be the president, I guess, is the way the Utah usage was working right. uh, up until David O. McKay's era, um, and and you can still see the difference in the in the like you say on the one hand based on the DNC, but also I've I've said for example if you are in the Mormon Church and you talk about the Prophet Joseph, you know who you're talking about. But if you were to talk about the Prophet George, that's right. just whoa, whoa what? <laughs> no one ever talks about George Albert Smith as the Prophet George, right? right? So it's a it's a it's different. There's a view. There is a definitely a view difference that's still kind of maintained there. Or the but prophet, you really yeah, yeah. you really see that when you actually though. Um, go to some of the other churches and you think, oh, you know, like when you go to the Strangai church, the Strangai church definitely had two prophets because Strang um, has as much material as Joseph Smith. And right. it is, and you really go there and there's, this is a two prophet church, not a one prophet church. Right. So it's a big difference. And just one last thing that I'll just throw in because I think it's important. The, the two of the main additions to, to the canon of Revelation in the LDS church today are actually repealing, not adding. They're saying we're taking away polygamy, or we're gonna we're gonna give blacks the priesthood like Joseph had it. They're not yeah. actually adding anything. They're actually taking taking away. Oh, okay. So okay, cool. So that's that's Next. preservationists. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And so the last one here is what I was just calling innovationists. And so um, there has a hymn in Nauvoo that used to be in the. Um, in the hymn book called "A Church Without a Prophet Is Not a Church for Me," uh, and they took that out of the um, LDS hymnal because <laughs> initially, what ended up happening was there wasn't initially for the there's this apostolic interregnum I mentioned where where Brigham Young wasn't formally set apart in the new first presidency. He was simply the acting head of the church because of his position as head of the quorum of twelve apostles, which was acting as the first presidency. But there were rivals who did claim to be prophets. So um, James Strang, Charles um, Thompson, jo Joseph Morris, um, and these are prophets who are. Um, in all cases, um, uh, prolific prophets. So you mentioned James Strang. He um, dug up new plates. He translated new um, new ancient records, or what he called were ancient records, uh, and he add, and they added, um, therefore, new scripture. So there's an additional book of standard works in the Strangite Mormon Church than existed in any other Mormon church. Um, likewise, Charles Thompson. So in the same exact way that um, 
that uh, Joseph Smith was busily engaged on re uh, revising the Bible, the Joseph Smith translation or inspired version of the Bible, um, Charles Thompson created an inspired version of the Ethiopic Book of Enoch, which is this uh, rewriting of the Book of Enoch that is filled with all kinds of Latter-day dis Saint distinctive ideas about Adam and Eve and all this kind of thing. So it's a very fascinating um, book but essentially there are in all of these cases so I've made this an additional color I mean and I'm doing I'm using these color codes where we're going from this New York blue to to Nauvoo yellow to secret practice orange so these guys I'm, I'm color coded here purple because the color is you know in other words the things are rolling on they have a Mormon foundation that's in common with all the rest of us but then they have this new stuff that is very different um, and I noticed you haven't mentioned the reorganized church of the community of Christ yet and there is no reorganized church yet at this point right. in the okay. history. Got it. So, Got it. Okay. Got it. So okay. Yeah. So in the in the in the initial time period here in the in the wake of uh, the um, martyrdom, uh, the Smith family uh, they temporarily leave Nauvoo. Everyone kind of tries to flee from Nauvoo. Is the it's not a safe place. But ultimately, uh, to secure uh, her home or property, Emma and her family end up. Um, staying and she lives the rest of her life in in Nauvoo and um, dies in the Nauvoo house uh, which is uh, this large hotel that the um, Joseph and the church were busily trying to make in in uh, in the during Joseph Smith's lifetime so anyway so they are still in in Nauvoo when almost no one else is uh, but they are not at this point affiliated the Smith family are not affiliated with any of these churches Got it. okay Okay, so I mentioned James Strang. Um, I just I, I, there's all these other one, all these different leaders, but I'm just going to highlight him a little bit uh, as we go to the next slide, um, just to talk about um, kind of an interesting alternative um, uh, for for leadership of the church. So Strang is a strange one to have emerged as such a powerful um, rival to Brigham Young because he was a relatively new member of the church. He um, uh, hadn't really held any. He wasn't part of the Nauvoo lead, lead at all. He was a guy who was living off in one of the branches. He lived in uh, Wisconsin. But he organizes a uh, new church headquarters which has that entire competing apparatus. Uh, he ends up being remarkably successful. He convinces at different times you know, key leaders to join him. So I listed off here some of the people, William Marks, William Smith, Lucy Smith, uh, Johnny Page, David Whitmer, John Whitmer, John C. Bennett even comes back to the church and <laughs> after his expose and becomes part of Strangite's church, um, Strang's church. Um, George Miller, George J. Adams, William McClellan comes back. So ultimately, he gathers um, uh, thousands into his. When you say Lucy Smith, do you mean Joseph's mom? Yeah, Joseph's mom. That's crazy. Joseph's brother William. Yeah. David Whitmer, one of the three witnesses, and John yeah. Whitmer, right? His brother, one of, one the, of the eight, eight. eight witnesses. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So David Whitmer and and John Whitmer, they're living off in Missouri still. They get a hold of um, of Strang's newspaper and his tracts. Um, John Whitmer, even though he's he's the first church's first historian, um, and he is excommunicated during the schism of of eighteen thirty eight when the when Joseph Smith reasserts control of the Missouri Church. He's one of the leaders of the Missouri Church that gets kicked out. Um, he continues to uh, keep his his book of history that he was commanded by Revelation to keep a history of the church. And so he re duly records that he was excommunicated from the church, and then he continues to record the history of the church for a while. So then, after the martyrdom of Joseph Smith, in his own history book, John Whitmer records that um, that. That James Strang is the successor, and that he um, that God raised up a successor to Joseph, and this is the new prophet, and this kind of thing. Wow. But then the Whitmers later decide that they were wrong about that, and so he crosses that out. Of the <laughs> book. <laughs> so, so ultimately, um, you know, a lot of these people were only affiliated for a little while. So Lucy Smith um, is very closely connected with her last surviving son, William Smith, who is able to negotiate with Strang. Uh, Strang recognizes William as presiding patriarch of the church, and William recognizes James Strang as prophet of the church. And so um, they are together for a while, and so Lucy, who is, is 
is um, affiliated with that, and the Strangites spend a lot of effort. They're very poor, as almost all of the early members are, but they're working very hard to try to uh, raise money to get Lucy to move from Nauvoo to, to Voree, Wisconsin, their new headquarters. Uh, but in the meantime, what ends up happening is that William and, and, and Strang have this falling out, and so William ends up leaving Strang's church and having his own church, in which case then well, Lucy also is no longer affiliated with Strang's mm. church. And it says here that he had ultimately had thousands in his in his you know religion, right? That many of these. And again, I want to make the point that they're uh, in, in a lot of cases the, in the branches, though. So they aren't all gathered to his headquarters. Yeah. Um, the um, number of people that are able to be in Voree, Wisconsin, is small because the property there is too expensive. But then Strang moves to Beaver Island, which is the largest island in Lake Michigan, and so then a lot of people do move up there, and has got a quite a successful colony. Uh, that affects northern Michigan history. And he kind of takes over the Kirtland Stake and sends missionaries to Britain, you say? Yeah. So one of the other big showdowns that happens, um, so people are constantly leaving the early church. Um, you know, that just is happening all the time. But it continues to grow because people are joining faster. Uh, and one of the reasons why they're joining so fast is that um, there's this horrible economic depression in northern Britain, uh, northern England, where... Um, where they're having a, uh, a, a depression after um, uh, the, the first round of the, the Industrial Revolution. And so for people who are just horrifically poor in Britain, they're, um, they're very uh, amicable. You know, they're interested in the Mormon message of, of the promised land being in America, that there's, you know, the regular American message the streets are paved with gold, but also we're building the Zion kingdom. And by the way, we have a perpetual immigration fund and we'll pay you to come over and <laughs> this kind of thing. So in other words, there's a huge influx of these British um, uh, converts. And so Utah ends up having a, um, a an overwhelmingly English character, unlike most of the United States. So if you look at um, the population figures, where is everybody from in the United States as of the 1870 census, Utah has this, um, this incredible British uh, or English um, over uh, or place of origin that's way out of proportion to the whole rest of the United States proportionally. Anyway, so the second showdown that happens um, after that that one that we've talked about um, in 1844 between Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young is that Strang wants to get a hold of this this entire uh, flow of uh, British converts, and so he sends Martin Harris, who is a um, become a Strangite. He sends Martin Harris as a missionary to um, uh, England, and Martin Harris says, "You, you're converted to the Book of Mormon. Well, look in the Book of Mormon. I, I am one of the three witnesses. That's I am, awesome. <laughs> and I tell you, you know, I can testify that the true successor <laughs> to my friend Joseph Smith is the Prophet James J. Strang, and um, wow. and and so it's a pretty powerful on paper." Um, <laughs> idea to do but uh, as we may well know from our own experience with martin harris as a in, in history he is not a stable guy uh he is not a wonderful representative you want on your team necessarily and so and so he's a little bit um anyway he discredits strang ultimately and the and the people don't go to beaver island michigan and instead they go to utah and so uh the 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 success of the utah church in terms of overall growth is is assured okay that's fun fun story but anyway, the um, the rest of the whole thing. So why did people follow this guy, right? <laughs> so here's James Strang again. He's not part of the core. But what he does do provide for people is he provides this image of prophetic leadership, which is what a lot of people are still longing for. This is the thing that incur that um, that attracted people to Mormonism during Joseph Smith's ministry in the first place. So on the one hand, he has a letter of appointment, which he believes or he says is appointing him to be a successor by Joseph, um, by right. Joseph yeah. Smith. But the other so simultaneously is argument is but it doesn't in in some ways yes that's that's the uh, scriptural thing that there's a section in the dnc that canonically says that joseph smith uh well you know if he falls he'll have no power save to appoint a successor and so that's where that is canonically makes him the successor but what's really important strang argues i think is that he at, at the moment of joseph smith's um martyrdom angels appeared to him and ordained him prophets here, revelator and translator for the church. And so that this is the, the spiritual gifts. It's not that anybody ever appointed Joseph Smith to be president in the first place. What ha matters is the divine portion, right? And so he argues that makes that case. He, um, 
digs up new plates. He has new witnesses of those plates. He makes new translations, new scriptures. There's new gathering places, uh, new temples under construction, new headquarters, new newspapers. So it's ultimately a very um, uh, exciting you know, thing for the people for whom uh, having constant innovations and constant restoration was, was the thing that they treasured most in their early Mormon experience. In other words, Joseph's model worked? Joseph's model worked, and he's he did a very good job at at, at um, carrying on with it. Yeah, got it. Okay, okay. So um, I'm going to bring now to another one of the p- potential successors, William Smith. So um, William here, he's one of the original apostles uh, of the Restoration. He's the last Smith brother alive after 1844. Um, he's got claim to this lineage. Um, role as being presiding patriarch evangelist to the church, which is the role that his father, Joseph Smith Sr., inaugurated and that went to Hiram, uh, uh, that Joseph Smith Sr. ordained his son Hiram as his eldest surviving son to that role. And uh, William claimed that, and initially Brigham Young agreed, but that's part of the breakdown that he has then with Brigham Young. Um, William is a has a lot of ego. <laughs> he likes to define, he wants to define, define that job as being way more than Brigham Young is, ex, is comfortable with William defining it. So, so, so he wants to call it, so William calls his title um, presiding patriarch over the church, <laughs> you know, and Brigham Young is very clear, no, you are presiding patriarch to the church, not even of the church, right? <laughs> so there's a big, there's a big gap between being the patriarch to the church and being patriarch over the church. Ultimately, um, he breaks with Brigham Young. Uh, he temporarily organizes his own church, later merges that with Strang, we mentioned, breaks with Strang, and ultimately uh, has his own church again. Uh, anyway, when he's doing that, though, he is continuously emphasizing this idea uh, into Midwestern Mormons, Mormons in Illinois, that that lineal priesthood is the true method of succession. So, so priesthood blood, right? within the blood, yeah, yeah within the right. Smith family. I just have to say, it must have been awful for Brigham Young to have so many of Joseph's family reject him because so much of the church is based on Joseph, yet those arguably closest to Joseph didn't didn't accept Brigham Young. So what a what a bold and sort of gravity defying feat to wrestle the entire well, not the entire, but a huge percentage of the organization that Joseph built away from Joseph's family. Right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It was a it was a big I mean it's a big deal and that's why I even say at the beginning of this whole thing it's it's almost uh you know this is why Emma is just you know looking at it solely from a Utah Mormon perspective Emma is this crazy strange Mormon enigma if we if we think about it from let's say from Joseph Smith the man's perspective if you ever imagine would you ever imagine that you uh, John Dolan as this founder of this religious movement this church and then your all of your children, all of your you know your your heirs, everybody that you have, you're totally out of it. In other words, your your best friends and companions, the people who you're working with in the church jobs, um, take it off some to some other state, and your your heirs have nothing to do with it. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's kind of a it's weird, right? So it is kind of a strange, um, you know, complete division between the family and the and the headquarters apparatus. It makes total sense why Emma was so maligned for so many years. Yeah. Yeah. So William, so anyway, I'm going to so make a little bit of comment now, if we go to the next slide, about kind of this understory that's happening this whole time. Um, uh, ultimately, you know, when you ask, okay, what is the, what is the civil war about in the U.S., you know, and the answer is slavery. Right, <laughs> no matter right. how much we might want to make it economic um, or state rights, economic or this kind of thing. If you if you look at the the if you look at the declaration that the Mississippi State Legislature had, why are they seceding from the Union? Why do they you know why do they have to have a second declaration of independence? They said the answer is slavery. <laughs> you know this is the you know the, the, yeah. anyway. So in the exact same way, um, the schism really in the wake of the, there's all of these things, there's these different competing leadership claims and everything like that, but the background story behind the, the all of this problem is polygamy. Right. And so um, I just have a little quick timeline here um, of kind of this background of happening in this whole time period. So 1843 is the um, 
polygamy revelation that ultimately becomes DNC 132 in the Utah tradition, but which is secret. And so it isn't published. It's not part of the, um, it's not even part of the Utah DNC until well into, into the Utah period. And that never made it into the community of Christ DNC, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. So yeah, the, oh, the old one is still in the community of Christ DNC. The one that the original DNC section that says that in as much as this church has been um, maligned with rumors of polygamy, we denounce it, right? <laughs> so it was like kind of section 110 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. 101 maybe. Okay. The, and you know, the numbers are all different because um, all of the numbers have all been reordered and shuffled and everything like that. In, from both, the in, early... in both traditions? Yeah. Okay. In both okay. traditions. So all okay. that you have to have a little chart about okay. what all the numbers mean. And the, so they're all different and there's difference from the 1837 DNC to the current Utah DNC and all that right. kind of things. Okay. Fine. All right. So, um, okay. So then we have there, okay. After that, the polygamy being one of the major things that leads up to the martyrdom itself. One of the balls that Joseph Smith is juggling that lead to the end. So then um, in 1846, um, Strang, who we mentioned as one of the successors, he actually denounces polygamy. So he's one of these guys who is out in the branches. He's not part of the inner circle. He doesn't um, personally believe it to be uh, – he thinks it's something that Bennett originally thought of or whatever it is. In other words, he doesn't, he doesn't think it's a valid teaching because Joseph Smith publicly has been denouncing polygamy with his kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of way that he was doing it, which is to say, I oppose polygamy because he's meaning privately, he's saying, but because polygamy is a human distortion of the true principle of celestial or plural marriage. Right. You know? And so he's publicly denouncing it, though. So Strang, as a successor, also denounces polygamy publicly and privately. Um, and so when I mentioned that M William Smith um, had merged in with Strang's church, one of the, the reason why Smith actually uh, gets excommunicated by Strang, why that, that connection doesn't hold, is because William moves to Wisconsin and does exactly what he had been doing under, under his brother, which is secretly um, practice polygamy and secretly teach polygamy, uh, and which Strang is opposed to, and get, he excommunicates William for that. In 47. Uh, in 47. But by 49, there have been so many elite inner circle members um, of, of the Nauvoo church who have joined with Strang that they've actually convinced him that Joseph Smith did practice polygamy, which he did. So in other words, there's, there's enough witnesses that Strang um, uh, un, you know, is convinced to it. And so then in 1849, he begins to practice polygamy. Right. Okay, and so then, in the meantime, William Smith has... has um, and Strang is fairly open about it fairly soon. So he doesn't have a lot of secret skulking about with it. He does in an initial thing that he does where he's first first practicing it and he has kind of a public relations fiasco. But later he's openly living in Michigan with with four wives or something at the end of his life. Um, the uh, in the William Smith, though, then having been kicked out of Strang's church previously for polygamy, has his own church where he's continuing to do Joseph Smith's practice of publicly denouncing polygamy, but, um, but secretly um, practicing it. So he's publicly denouncing it, secretly practicing it, uh, and people continuously in, in William Smith's church are catching him at it. <laughs> and so he continues to kind of get in trouble. And so that leads up to ultimately um, 1853, when William Smith is actually um, indicted in Illinois for statutory rape because he's practicing polygamy with an underage wife. And so he ends up getting kicked out of his own kind of William Smith Church for polygamy, which is this this um, uh, kind of uh, mid Midwestern anti polygamy church, since all of his followers are against polygamy, <laughs> even though he's practicing it. Right. So it's 1852 that Brigham Brigham Young and his church start admitting to the practice openly, although it's quite an open secret. Everybody's aware of that it's doing out there, but it, it was ultimately an embarrassment. You know, the missionaries, uh, John Taylor, I think, is a missionary, and he's just barely published one of these nudge, nudge, wink, wink denunciations of polygamy. Then the paper arrives the next day um, in which they're openly practicing it now, and so then John Taylor has to have his, this kind of humiliating or embarrassing react, you know, retraction, you know, oh, forget what I just said yesterday, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So yeah, anyway, Taylor so was practicing happening. it while publishing a pamphlet denying its practice, right? 
that's everybody's policy. That was Joseph Smith's policy, and that was everybody's policy. That continued to be Emma's policy, although she was not also practicing it, but she continued to denounce it for the rest of her life as it publicly denouncing it so and pretending that it didn't happen. Right. And that was what everybody did. That's what Joseph Smith did, and that's what the policy was until 1852 for the Brighamites when they admitted to it openly. What made Brigham time. Young admit to it? Do we know? Was there... It had to have been preposterous not to um you build this house that has <laughs> all these <laughs> you know yeah. you know you build a lion house or this kind of thing i mean everybody who goes to went to utah i mean it was it was not an open it wasn't a secret secret anymore you, the Brig, you, Nauvoo, brigham young's um polygamy uh is completely different from joseph smith's which is joseph smith's is a secret practice that is um just the select few in the inner circle that are, you know, committed to this practice that's secret. Brigham Young opens it up really widely, uh, and is m much more widely practiced. And anybody who, um, you know, was going west to the gold rush or any other thing, you know, noted that this was happening. So it was a, quite an open secret. Okay, but we don't know if there's any specific event that forced his hand in 1852 to make it public. Yeah, I'll have to ask. Okay. A, a Utah historian. That's fine. So I'm, I, you know, so I, you, I don't know exactly, but it definitely by the open practice got him in trouble, and um, it's one of the reasons why uh, uh, Utah wasn't able to be a state for so long. Right. Okay. You know. Okay. So, okay, and so then ultimately in 1856, then James Strang, who's subsequently become a, a polygamist, uh, open polygamist, uh, his is himself martyred. So he also and all of his uh, followers are expelled from Beaver Island in Lake Michigan, uh, in much the same way that the saints had been earlier. Saints had been expelled <laughs> from from uh, Missouri, where the Joseph Smith had been killed. So he and really so, replicated Joseph's model. <laughs> he did it all the whole way. <laughs> he did the full Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. That's that's, that's, right. that's disrespectful. <laughs>